Good evening to all our viewers. Aja and IDAC with immense pleasure would like to present Master Speaks, decoding architect Brinda Samaya in conversation with architect Vidya Kuru Khegre. Our sponsor for today's webisode is Everest Industries. I hope this session is inspirational and motivational. Before we start the session, we would like to present a short AV from our sponsor, Everest Industries. And thereafter, architect Vidya will take the lead. Thank you. We always start with a blank piece of paper. The idea usually comes as a sudden spurt and once that clicks, uh, I think we're all very excited. It should give you goose flesh. I think for me, architecture is really a discovery. We are actually dealing with elements such as the wind, sunlight, rain, shadow and creating spaces which you've only imagined, which you've actually never created before. Architecture is made up of materials. So the choice of materials is obviously extremely important. I think our discovery, so to say, of the fiber cement board, which could be used, uh, was very fascinating. The board itself allowed us to create a palette uh, where we had this gray, clay-like surrounding and then we had little jewels of art juxtapositioned against this, this very grey background. I feel using prefab boards in a mechanical clamping way adds uh, to some kind of an insulation if it is used as a second skin on a building and that also adds to save your air conditioning cost. Also they are aesthetically very very beautiful especially the modes which have come now the textures of wood stone and other finishes. When you're using prefabricated boards and you're using so many of the prefabricated walls, then specifically we talk about efficiency in terms of the fact that it's locally made and definitely something which is locally made is far more efficient. The fact that a material which can be bought and come to site in literally three days can be cut and be used and be put up so quickly is something which is going to save you time. Cost-wise, it's extremely efficient. So definitely using these materials plays a part in creating a sustainable structure. We are doing one APMC market in Latur. Uh, there the whole concept is that we are putting all the prefab structures all together as a semi-lax if you develop it. So it's supposed to be complete in four months' time. So we did uh, DNA in mean, one of our projects, which we did the whole factory of 200,000 square feet was completed in two and three months' time, and uh, including the press and everything uh, put together. So there are so much of advantages of using the new things. We designed a building uh, in Delhi where we proposed a hollow column, hollow beam system. Uh, then using these uh, paneling systems to cover the whole um, structural and service framework. So even the flooring would be just stones on neoprene pads. So you can actually dismantle the whole building after it's used and have a little, you know, ecological footprint in the area. So I think a prefab uh, methodology allows you to achieve that very easily. We were using this particular thing. We were able to reduce 30 mm sizes to uh, 19 mm sizes. We were able to reduce the structural costings of the facade. And I think that that's very important in architecture that we, we constantly question our work and we constantly evolve it. Good evening, friends. I'm Vidya Kurup Hegde of the 1995 batch. I still remember the summer of 1995. I was in the wooden staircase of the National Assurance Building. I was headed for a job interview. I was going to be interviewed by one of the most sought after architects. Sorry, I stand corrected. I was going to be job interviewed by one of the most sought after Indian 
woman architect of that time. I was nervous. I was scared. I had butterflies in my stomach as I was so much in awe of the personality that I was about to meet. Today, 25 years later, history repeats itself. However, the tables have turned. Today, I have the privilege of interviewing one of the most decorated Indian woman architects whose works speak of her creative legacy. To designing, conceptualizing, and restoring some of the iconic landscapes of our present times. In spite of all the echelons, she's still that warm and loving person that I knew since then. Today, once again, I have butterflies in my stomach as I discreet with her. Please join me in welcoming none other than architect Brinda Somaya. Welcome. It's such a privilege. Thank you, Vidya. It's such a pleasure to see you after so many years again. Uh, I always remember all the young people who worked and trained with us. Many still with us. Many have gone on to achieve their own uh, accolades. And I'm so proud of each one of them. So I'm very happy to be here today. Same, ma'am. I just jumped at the opportunity when one of the IDAC AJA team told me, you know, can you get in touch with uh, architect Somaya and ask her if she would give us the interview. And I said, anything to say hello to her, you know, it's always you take away something every day I take away something from you, ma'am. It's always such a pleasure. Uh, ma'am, let's jump on right to the interview as such. Uh, everybody about your life, your uh, professional, uh, you know, milestones post 1975. We want to get a glimpse of what your childhood, what teenage days were like, ma'am. So, so let me begin with uh, why I became an architect. I think that's what's really important. I was just uh, eight years old when my parents took me to uh, the famous Nalanda University in Bihar. My father and mother and my sister and I would often travel through India. Those days, it wasn't going to Dubai or Hong Kong. It was India that we all wanted to see and travel. So we used to drive around the country. And I remember being mesmerized by the brick in this wonderful Nalanda monastery and university. And there I am standing in the middle with a, a hand on my uh, hip, as you can see. And that's when I thought I want to become an archaeologist. But after many years, um, I finally became an architect. Um, as this is, of course, connected with JJ, I located two very old photographs. The one on the top left is uh, uh, all of us taking a class. In, I graduated in 1971. We were hardly 10 girls in the class. So you can see us on the right side, right in the front, front two rows and all the boys at the back. And the lower picture on the left is our graduating class in 1971. I then went on to the United States uh, where I got a master's degree here from Smith College. You can see that on the right. And uh, I did a lot of summer design at Cornell University. And after so many decades, I am now currently the A.D. White professor at Cornell University. So it's taken a full circle almost. So I first began my uh, st studio, I like to call it, the picture on the left. It was an old Mali's room. It was a single room with a big mori in the middle. And uh, there was just me. And then uh, we had one person uh, who, who used to come part time. My sister came back uh, to India for about two or three years. And unfortunately, she went back again uh, to, to Holland. So what I thought could have been a wonderful two-person two uh, uh, studio ended up being me alone. But I decided to move on, bash on regardless. Uh, the upper right picture is how we used to draft those days with the T-square. And I worked only six months in one office, which was just terrible because I wasn't allowed to turn right or left. 
And even to go to the loo, I had to get permission from my boss. So things have changed a huge, huge amount today. And I love to give freedom to my people, freedom in work, freedom in design, freedom in many, many things. The bottom photograph you can see is I built a, was part of a big team to build a big hotel in the Soviet Union in 1990. And what that project taught me, I was very lonely here in a way because there were very few women who even had their own studios. But when I went there to Russia and to Tashkent where the hotel was, we worked with a lot of women structural engineers and women mechanical engineers. And I think it opened different um, worlds to me that, that women really do have a place, a big place, hopefully in our profession. And the top right you can see at a site and the bottom right picture is my is me with my daughter Nandini who now has been working with me for the last 14 years and who will take of course our studio forward with our many many loyal architects and wonderful professionals who have been with me for decades. So that's a little bit about my background video. Uh, I'm curious to know here is what was life like in the US in the 1970s? Very few went there for post graduation, and I'm sure very few women went there during 1970s for post graduation. Uh, how was it for you? You you have a very secure life back in Mumbai. You left all that and you went for your post graduation. Yes, but that wasn't the first time I went to the US. Uh, when I was 16, I applied to something called the American Field Service, which was a high school exchange. In fact, people look back and say, how did your parents ever let you go abroad at the age of 16? Those days, there wasn't even a direct flight to New York. I remember we were 50 of us, uh, uh, AFS students, what we called ourselves. And we flew from Mumbai to Beirut, Beirut to Istanbul, Istanbul to Gander in Canada and then to New York. So it was a different world. It was, you know, the late 60s. And I was very young and I wanted to travel. I've always loved traveling and I have traveled the world at this age now. And so uh, I spent a year and completed high school in the United States and then came back, finished my architecture school at JJ. So to go back for the second time wasn't so frightening because the first time I actually went to the southern part of the United States, the school where I attended actually had just been desegregated. There was segregation in many parts of that city. So it was a whole different experience than coming from a very protected background from the city of Mumbai. So the world opened up in many, many ways. So that's how it was. I totally agree with you, ma'am. I think, uh, you know, I, Nandini, your daughter, she was a lawyer earlier and now she's an architect. In my case, it was the other way around. I came from a family of lawyers and I happened to be an architect. And the only reason why probably I stuck around with architecture is because of the travel associated with it. It's truly fascinating and it teaches you something more. So I, I can totally relate to what you're, you know, you're saying. Uh, Ma'am, but after so many experiences in the U.S., those days, the U.S. meant sticking around there and never coming back to India. What prompted you to return? Actually, after I finished my uh, finishing my master's from Smith, I had also got into a second master's program, both at Columbia University and at Cornell University. And I had actually accepted Columbia to do a second master's. And I remember it was March and uh, I don't know what happened to me. One day I just decided that what I really wanted to do was to go home. I think when I was doing summer school at Cornell, I remember going for a lunch which this group of professors had organized with some Indian students. And I remember listening to them and they spent the whole afternoon talking about India. But it was in India they had left 10, 15 years ago. And in many years, it was so out of sync. It was so outdated because those days we didn't have the internet. We didn't have technology. We didn't have instant communication. So everybody was so many years, so months behind the other countries. 
And I just imagine myself 20 years from now sitting in one of those houses and talking about India and realizing that how peripheral I would have been to my own country, how peripheral my work would be, uh, how insignificant in many ways that my work would be. What contribution could I really make in another country which was so foreign and alien in many ways to my thinking and my working? And I guess that was weighing on me, but the temptation to continue staying and working in the U.S. was great, which was made, made me why I applied to these colleges and got in. But finally, one day in March, I remember calling my mother and saying, I'm coming home. And she said, but what? You've accepted Columbia and, and you're going. And I said, no, now I'm going to write to them and tell them I'm coming home. And I came home and no regrets. <laughs> wow. We are glad you came back, ma'am. Could be part of your professional legacy. Uh, Ma'am, from what I understand, one of your first professional milestones as an independent, you know, practice was the presidency club work. Can you give us an insight into how you landed up with your first project and how did you go about? Well, uh, when I after I came back after some time, I got engaged to my husband, who was a surgeon, who is a surgeon, and he was in the army at that time. And uh, it, uh, we were going to be moving around. So I was really not doing anything uh, for a few months. And my father told me that, you know, the U.S. club, the United Services club is looking for some uh, drawings for a small uh, sort of edition. And it's a pro bono job. And since you're doing nothing, why don't you just help them out? So that's the first thing I actually did for the United Services Club, prepared a little edition for the, for the club. And that never got built. But at that committee was uh, a gentleman who was on the Bombay Presidency Golf Club. He liked what I presented. And then I got my first project, which was a swimming pool and extensions to the main club building of the BPGC. At that club, on that committee was... Uh, a gentleman called Mr. Chauhan, who then gave me subsequently my first major work for the Pale Products Company, which I have been their architect of for the last 40 years, two generations. And over these years, we have been factories for them, residences, all sorts of things. And I always remember that it was those, those works that enabled me to have the confidence that maybe now, maybe I can start something on my own. And by then, uh, Anand, my husband, uh, subsequently left the army and we moved to Mumbai. And then I set up my small practice in the Mali's shed. <laughs> Ma'am, if I recall correctly, club work and your first born child, those were the two major milestones. Yes, that's right. That's right. Vikram was born and... I remember I was uh, seven months, uh, I mean, I was almost due and I wanted to go and see the casting of the roof slab. My mother was very upset with me and she said, I'm coming with you. And I went and I climbed up to the top and there were a series of women who were working, women laborers. And they looked at me with so much empathy. And I think that's my first bond that I had with both men and women labor, but particularly with women labor. In those days, children also used to be on the side. So for the last four decades, they've always been very, very important to me in my work to ensure that they have decent living conditions, they have decent wages. And that's another story. But I think that started uh, from the look that I got from them, a look of we understand you and where you're coming from. And I hope that I then understood them and where they were coming from. That's, that's, that's wonderful, ma'am, because very few architects even turn back to look at the workers who are working it. And there are so many of them. Luckily, off late, we don't have children on the sites anymore. But you're absolutely right as far as women go. There are quite a bit of that we as architects pay attention to their living conditions too. After all, they are the ones who are making our creations, our drawings into reality. Ma'am, a personal aspect of you. Uh, it, it always surprises me because you have such a demanding professional career. 
your husband very demanding professional career how did you navigate the roles of being a daughter wife mother now you're a grandmother tech social worker curator and most importantly being brinda somaya the strong the passionate and the kind individual how how did all these roles at one go i don't think any individual really separates themselves into different sections i think we're uh, we're, we're just who we are and, and i think if we believe in what we are doing if we love what we're doing that's very very important and we believe it's important to us and it's important to the family also because unless there is self worth for yourself there will not be self worth uh, for the family either uh, my husband has always supported me he's been a great support is a strong silent type but was always there behind me to support me and uh, my children uh, they understood they had a working mother and uh, i remember one day i came back earlier than i should from work and they were both at the tea table and i started asking them questions you know it was about 4:30 i used to come home only at about 6 and finally they said you know mom why don't you just go back to work because this 4:30 to 6 is our time to enjoy when we get back from school <laughs> so you know you you sort of live your life uh, you believe in in everyone around you i've had a super support from somayan kalapa snk as we now call ourselves uh, we've had my my personal assistant has been with me i think 25 26 years i just have to start a sentence and mabel can finish it we have a large group of senior people who have been with us for decades so we are a family so work has always been like a family of people who work together even during this covid crisis i am happy to say that i have not terminated a single person and, and it is now july and right from march well, our entire team has been working together remotely all of us together and if we have to make it of snk intact to the best of our ability uh, ma'am all of us have some key influencer or mentors who have been there you know at different points of our life or probably have said or it's an incident that happened in your life uh, can you share with us any such moments or any such mentor who's been part of your life well i think uh, for me it was really my family to be honest because i had a very isolated work situation for many years uh it my father played a very important role uh he was a electrical engineer a power engineer my mother was a uh micro she was a uh zoologist in fact who did her thesis on sharks and uh and my immediate family in whom i've already mentioned the reason i'm saying this is because from 1980 to 1990 was a very lonely time for me i worked alone uh there wasn't really any support from the profession there were very few women who had their own studios but it was a good thing that happened because i built up a lot of of reserve a lot of strength and i also built up a portfolio of works they may have been smaller works but unless you do the smaller works you don't get the larger projects as you move on so it was a very crucial time for me uh but today things are different because uh, i i am involved with many things globally internationally so i have wonderful friends and in almost of course apart from a group of wonderful friends in india architects and uh, structural engineers etc i have friends around the world and all of them i consider as my mentors i can call on any of them for advice for help in the united states in australia in europe so that's the the network that i now have but it was not there in the beginning it began with perhaps the women in architecture conference which i'll come to later which i organized in uh, 2000 till then it was a lonely uh, a lonely journey professionally yeah i i 
I agree with you, ma'am, because I have twice the opportunity of meeting your mother, and I must say she was she was a strong personality. So I guess yeah, your family would have been the key influences probably. Uh, ma'am, you mentioned about you know Mabel being with you, ma'am secretary, being with her for the last twenty five years. I also know a few of you know the members in your team. They have been there with you for nearly two and a half, three decades. How do you scout talent? How do you train them? Most importantly, ma'am, how do you retain them? I think uh, one of the most important things is I've never believed that architecture is an assembly line, and that that you have young people who will do all the drudge work. and then you will have a senior person who will meet the cli clients and you will have in between people who will do all the the drawings we are not an advertising agency who works in that sort of a way architecture is very very collaborative and communicative so the way we work is we have groups of people within the office and that group with uh, in between years of experience and senior people and all of them are involved with every aspect of the job right from the beginning meeting the client whether it's brainstorming for concepts and ideas learning about how to do drawings if you're junior moving on and then finally going to the site so the projects become your projects their projects and they become so so interesting for each one of them and i think that's uh, perhaps uh, how our studio might be different from what studios were earlier i'm not sure now i'm sure there's a lot of change now and uh, i think maybe that's what uh, you know kept the family strong and together i i agree with you ma'am because freshy from college and uh, barely 6 months of working with your firm and you put me in charge of one of the interior projects with a very reputed company uh, you just had some seniors mentoring me in the background but they never came for any meetings or whatever and Uh, you you kept asking me about the latest updates and you gave me support in the background and i think that was one of the key reasons of you know having that much of confidence in myself at a later stage as such and i always remember every time i have a newcomer working with me i always remember the confidence that you had instilled in me to take on a new project so yeah now that you're talking about it i can recall what that you had given me when i was working with you ma'am uh not taking taking any time further now ma'am we would all like to hear about your job professional highlights and the way i i don't think you can talk about one project i think there will be multiple projects where you will be having so many key things associated with project ma'am so the stage is over to you ma'am kindly of <laughs> take us through your so um it's very important to have a a philosophy and our design philosophy is by taking certain important elements and principles and whether it can be water these are all images of different projects that we have done so how do we use water light of course is one of the most important things as as we all know in india uh what is the use of light how do we use it the use of different types of walls the geometry of architecture which is which is so important so to the left we have the church that we did uh, below we have the nalanda schools to the right we have the goa institute of management so these are the elements that we begin with that we feel are very very important whether it's a different type of old materials all this has to be studied so today i thought i would just run through a few slides um talking about the five c's because this is what has been my belief right from the beginning when we first started uh, uh somaya and kalapa which was me and my sister as i mentioned ranjini kalapa and then uh, after she left and moved away over the years we have now made it snk so these are the five important things that snk believes in community city contemporary work culture and collaboration you know where we we feel that all we have a very diverse practice we have a very diverse country that we live in and i believe that every single architectural practice should 
be able to do all these different aspects of work. In, I mean, we have 10,000 monuments in India. We cannot have a handful of conservation architects only looking after that. Every single architect has to be a conservationist. Every single architect has to be concerned about their cities, about the culture and history of our country, about contemporary work, which is a different type of creative work, and collaborations. So all this has to be part of every practice, and particularly our practice has always been that way. So I've chosen a couple of projects for each one of these Cs. Uh, this is, of course, the very historic Rajabai Tower and uh, the University Library, which we completed uh, restoring, and we won a UNESCO award for this also. So you can see the picture to the right, which is the magnificent uh, library hall on the first floor and how we restored it to its original beauty. Then I come to a very important group of buildings, uh, which are modern architecture that's less than 100 years old. And of course, many of you will recognize this as the Indian Institute of Management by Louis Kahn. And we, were, we won a competition to do this project. And we have completed the building that you see straight ahead, which is the library building. To the left, uh, the interiors, which uh, we, we respected what Louis Kahn had done. And yet we had to upgrade this building to today's needs in terms of technology. So what was so important about this group of buildings is that it's shown for the first time a group of 20th century buildings are being restored for today. And it will work as a catalyst for many other 20th century buildings that exist in our country. And we know that a lot of them are being knocked down, not just our old colonial buildings, but even modern buildings are being knocked down. And what's coming up in their place, we have to look at. So this uh, was very important. It won the award of distinction uh, of UNESCO. And I think the reason they gave it to us, apart from the work we did, was a story that this building is telling our country we have such a wealth of architecture, don't lose it. Then, of course, we come to contemporary work, which is a very, very different type of work and creativity. This was a campus we did for data consultancy services in Indore. It was a hundred acre plot. It was enormous in scale. It was a million square feet we had to design and build. And the entire campus is completed. So the challenges that come from designing something like this, apart from scale, the land really was just a flat piece of land. There was, there was nothing very, very important in terms of uh, a beautiful water body or any mountains or hills or gradients. And so we use the idea of the Narmada River uh, as the metaphor to flow through uh, in the three phases of uh, the Narmada flowing right from where it begins through the marble rocks and ending in the Gulf of Kambat. And we use that as an idea uh, to develop this campus and it's completed and uh, fully used by very young people. So it's got to be the idea of, of youthfulness. And of course, again, post COVID, the fact that there's a lot of open space, it's not crowded, it's not a glass box. So something like this can be used very effectively by the client today. And they don't have to worry about uh, you know, overpopulating it or any danger. Another contemporary project we did, but in a very different way, which I showed you in the building, the brick. We had a client who came to us and said they wanted to build a school complex called Nalanda. And I was really excited because I had in my mind all this brick. And uh, over four phases, we completed four different schools in a single campus. And uh, it was, uh, it's about 250,000 square feet, completely non-air conditioned. And except for the computer lab, and now the head, the principal's room, because it was almost like, how come he doesn't have an air conditioner? So we used very, very Indian traditional ways of, of cooling, ventilating. We had courtyards, we had double walls, we had greenery, we had pergolas. So it shows that this can be done, uh, that we don't have to build glass boxes and then use very expensive air conditioning to cool them. We have to go back to our traditional thoughts, ideas, and ways of building. 
And this one, of course, the LEAF Award, particularly for its environmental strengths and how we can build today without air conditioning. It's very, very important. Then we come to culture and museums. That's been, uh, I think uh, Nandini has been very interested in this as well. Uh, the museums and exhibitions that now we are doing a lot. It's very youthful. We have a lot of young people. We have the next generation in SNK who are working a lot. And this was a wonderful exhibition that uh, the museum CSMVS appointed us for. It was called India and the World. And it was a collaboration with the British Museum, the National Museum in Delhi, and the CSMVS. And we had such a wonderful learning experience uh, designing this entire uh, exhibition and gallery over two floors of the museum, uh, telling the story of India and the world, but not India in the world. So it was, it was just fascinating for us. Subsequently, of course, the CSMBS has given us several other projects. We've done their textile gallery. We've done a St. Thomas Cathedral uh, gallery. And these two are images of the recently opened jewelry and coin galleries. So this uh, enriches the studio's understanding of, of history, of culture, of geography, and, and working with the most wonderful curators from around the world. So these were just fascinating experiences for our studio. Coming to the city, one of the most, the only project I'm showing you which has not been fulfilled is the Mumbai Esplanade project. And this was, I worked with Professor Sidhu and a group of our own team to think, what do we do with the six lakhs of people who just fall out of stations the, the Churchgate station, the VT station, and have nowhere to go. They fall into the road. So like European cities, we came up with a proposal called the Mumbai Esplanade Project, where we would create plazas uh, next to these stations and create 50 acres of additional space by connecting right from VT up to Churchgate through the Azad Maidan and the Oval Maidans and, for, and take the cars underground. I am very, very uh, strong on this that I feel cars are destroying our cities. We're widening our roads. We're breaking down our heritage buildings so that more and more cars come into the central part of the city. I do realize we all go in cars. We need cars. But we must pedestrianize the historic and central part of our cities. Otherwise, they will get destroyed. This is happening all over Europe. Why do we love to go to Europe and see that? old beautiful plazas and centers of cities because they have preserved them because they made sure that cars have not overtaken them. This is very, very important. So a project like this needs political will. It needs bureaucratic will. Not easy to get. We tried for two years. Uh, I hope the next generation will take it up and fight even further for pedestrianizing. We have an opportunity now post COVID. And this is the time to say, we want to pedestrianize the center part of that city. We're going to have a metro. We're going to have public buses, but we're not going to let cars come all over the place, increasing by hundreds of thousands every year. This was important because it was the Kalaba Woods Garden, which was a dumping ground uh, on Cuff Parade. And it was a four acre project. Why it was important, it was done in, in very early and it was the first public-private partnership of creating gardens in Mumbai. After we did this, several other gardens have been created all over the city on public-private partnership. It was a garbage bin, uh, and now today it's one of the most beautiful gardens. One of the big metro stations is coming up next to it. I hope all the trees will survive. What was important is typical of Mumbai. It was surrounded by very expensive housing and the slums. And we fought to make sure that the MCGM would not charge for entry and that everybody would be allowed in free of charge into this garden. We built a gazebo so that the slum children could study at night. We had a place for the older people to sit, benches. And this, uh, all these are stories, you know, uh, different stories to tell about our, our work. And the community. What's important in the community, finally? This is a... Of, but sort of an orphanage for the girl child. It is really the abandoned girl children whose parents can't afford to educate them, 
who would have been selling things under a station, how can they be protected? So Voice, which was an NGO, came to us and asked us to build a residential school for these young children. It had a very small budget. It was in one northern suburbs of Mumbai. And it's a wonderful story. We designed a very simple group of buildings. You can see to the left the girl children. They learn how to sew. They learn how to uh, do different things so that they can become independent and also uh, get income of their own. Because unless you're financially independent as a woman, uh, you are not going to be able to, uh, take, to take things further. And of course, our, our Budli village, which was devastated by the earthquake uh, in, in 2000, which we completely rebuilt. Uh, the houses were all demolished uh, by the earthquake. We worked with the panchayat. We rebuilt the village. We built the school there. You can see pictures of the school. It's now chosen by the Fiden Atlas as one of the uh, best buildings of the uh, 20. 20, 21st century buildings. It's in their book. And it's a very, very inexpensive uh, school which we built with the local community. Uh, we restored uh, a lot of the old buildings, plus we built a lot of new buildings. You can see the artwork uh, that the women and the villagers painted. Uh, Budli, after so many years, is doing extremely well. We've kept in close contact with the villagers and we have a lot of stories to tell about them and how they have become self-sufficient in many ways. So finally, I, I would like to talk just two more slides. One is the Hekar Foundation, which I started uh, with in, two, in 2000, mainly to organize um, a conference, uh, Women in Architecture. But now we have brought out many books uh, over the last, uh, well, 20 years almost. Uh, which are available, of course. Uh, they come, HECAR is an acronym for Heritage, Education, Conservation, Architecture, and Restoration. And HECAR also uh, sponsored, curated, and helped uh, these two very, very important conferences, which I was the chairperson of, but very, very much supported by SNK and lots of other groups of people. 2000 was Women in Architecture. Uh, which was primarily for South Asia. The first women architects we were able to get from Pakistan and representatives Sri Lanka and uh, also um, uh, uh, Sri Lanka and India, of course. Perrin Mistry, who was not alive then, but her brother came to the conference. And then 20 years later, we did Women in Design 2020, which was an international conference because now Indian women architects are on the map globally, and uh, we got um, the most amazing women from around the world to come, and we had this conference just in time pre-COVID, and uh, I'm sure many of you may have attended, and uh, we, we, we showcased what women have done in architecture and connected fields, and how we are so proud of our women uh, in design. That's all I can say. Thank you. Ma'am, that was quite a lineup. And, uh, yeah, the women in design 2020 had such rave review, uh, reviews from the fraternity. Whoever attended it had only good things to say about it. Uh, I'd like to end the, uh, the interview session with one of the projects which is most important to you, that is your book. It's one of the only documented book of an Indian woman architect. So the book is Brinda Somaya, Work in Continuities. We are going to play a short video showing the making of the book. Kindly enjoy the video. Thank you. We lived in Calcutta till I was about uh, eight or nine years old. We had just two daughters, my sister Ranjini and I. So we grew up with a, with a lot of freedom. 
when we were quite young we used to travel all over india and i remember even today standing on the steps in nalanda at the ancient ruins of the old buddhist university and being mesmerized in a way by the brick and the ruins and imagining what it must have been so i guess um, my interest in archaeology and architecture perhaps in some way was born at that time well as you know i set up the hekar foundation in 2000 which is an acronym for heritage education conservation architecture and restoration so my first experience with uh, publishing came at that time uh, because we were a, a non-profit organization and we had many interests we began to publish books ourselves but i never ever thought of publishing a book about my work and uh, when nandini came into the practice um, there were i had more opportunity and more time Uh, to accept invitations around the world to lecture and also to teach in my own way and i remember after every uh, lecture that i gave people would come up to me and ask me uh, where can we get a book on your work and uh, that was a strange question for me that people were asking me for a book on my work i guess there's always an anxiety for me that uh, what happens when she goes and i want all of this to remain in a way one thing i was very clear that the book had to be my voice i wanted to tell my story it had to be my narrative of course i got enormous amount of help from the team we began just accumulating the information so just putting together old drawings and right from her thesis days to you know almost 35 years ago that really took its time as well all three of us me nandini and mrs soma were sure that you know it will be an exercise which will be more reflective wherein we kind of look back at the practice and see what values it has built over the years the ideas of curation from rituraj as to how the book should be structured without it being overwhelming as there were over 200 projects that were built across these decades but that there be several aspects and i think that's another very important part that miss samaya herself and i wanted that the book have the vital milestone projects that created um and really pushed the firm further across the decades that it um had dialogues that uh, were important in conversation because I think her interests go so beyond architecture they go into history they go into the city into urban development into uh, so many other aspects of life as architecture does these dialogues between mrs soma and uh, the people uh, whom have known her uh, in different capacities but are professionally equal to her coming from very different diverse backgrounds uh, like arun shori who has this um, this strong political uh journalistic uh philosophical view of india and uh he and mrs somaya they talk about india uh, in very sort of in in their from the different perspectives with saryu doshi it was about culture uh, you know bishi being a curator um uh, raised the question that whether architecture is a cultural production of course it is but what value then does it hold Similarly with Kamu Iyer Mary Norman Woods curated one conversation which was just about practicing from Bombay the structure of the book becomes interesting it just doesn't become a long narrative which is singular but is constantly dynamic as a reader goes through it the essays were not just about me but was the context of architecture and in some ways how the practice existed at that time how it affected architecture what it meant so uh, there are many many angles to this book and i think that's what makes it quite unique in many ways it is it was also important for me that this book should be readable by students of architecture and uh, i hope they will learn from it for the book we revisited many many projects that were uh, mostly done over the period of 40 years so uh the kind of project that was built past um 20 years back and uh, we had read a lot about it in the office we had studied a lot of material about it we knew how the project looked like but those were shot back then when they were done 
it was so exciting to go and see how the project looked now we wanted the work to be honest and we wanted to show it honestly and that it still holds good for today and there is a sense of timelessness and that sense of timelessness also has to hold good with the book though she she has that very modern aspect in her architecture she still is rooted very uh, strongly like she has one foot in both worlds so we had that had to come out in the design as well she had a very beautiful uh, emotion and a thought behind why she wants to write it and she was very clear that this was going to be her story which was told very honestly by not having the word architecture in in the title uh, and having the word works is important because uh, as mrs somaya says uh, it's it's the practice is not just about architecture the work does not limit itself to the aspects of doing architecture and building it is a cultural practice it's a social practice it's as a practice in economics and of of craft and 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 a, and a very different um it it touches all this diverse and an unbelievably wide disciplines and somehow uh, she is the you know uh, once she said a conductor of a very disorganized orchestra of course my role will change of course responsibilities will change uh what i do with my time will change how much time i want to spend uh doing certain things will also change but i don't think that i can ever be separated uh from architecture because it really it's my entire being